this is the definition of what it means to execute a Turing machine. And I've slightly modified the definition that's in the book. You can see there's a bit of an issue discussion about what the right definition should be. What it means to execute is we're trying to get an output, right? The, the value that we're getting from executing a machine that matters is the output of that machine. And we're going to find that output by initializing the tape. So this is where that, that special triangle symbol is there. That's going to be on the first square. Then the rest of the squares are going to be the input, each symbol in one square. And then we get to the last input symbol. And everything after that is blank. We're executing it on some input, so we've got to start by configuring the tape to encode the input. This is different from our circuit models where we encoded the input as input wires to the circuit. Right here we're using the scratch paper that we can use in the computation also as the way to encode the input. We're going to keep track of two variables. This is definitely a sort of informal way of describing the model. Right? It's assuming things that are not really always defined in mathematics. These are variables that we're going to be able to update. We're changing their value. But we're changing their value, and, and we're doing a loop. So this assumes some understanding of computing that should make you a little uncomfortable, because we're defining what's supposed to be a mathematical model using intuitive notions of what a repeat loop means. OK. And so at each step, we're going to look up in the transition function what s, which is recording the current state. And you can see s is initialized to 0. So there's a special state 0, which is always the state we started. Some definitions of Turing machines have an extra parameter, which is the initial state. But this definition says, we'll always start in state 0. That's nice and simple. What is the meaning of i? Take a second to look at how we use i. So i starts at 0. We use i here, and we update i. Right? This, this r is moving right, we update i. This l is moving left, we update i. Can you figure out what i is representing? Yeah. Yeah, it's where we are on the tape. i equals 0 is the leftmost square. As we operate, this is i equals 0. This is going to be i equals 1. Each square has an index. So as we move around on the tape, you can think of a tape head moving left or right, we update the value of i. Initially, it's 0, so we're starting here. And then each step, we're going to look up the transition function. Remember, the transition function takes two inputs. It takes a state and a symbol. So these are the three outputs that are returned, the new state, the new symbol, and the direction. And then we update the state. We update the tape. This is replacing what was there with some new symbol, if it had a new symbol. And then we move. The definition said, the direction can be s to stay. That means i wouldn't change, so we don't actually need to do anything if it's s. Are we done? Are we happy with our definition of what it means to execute a Turing machine? So our transition function, to define the machine, we have to define the transition function. And that tells us how to update the machine. Each step is taking one transition. And we are using it right here in step one in the repeat loop. We are looking at our current i, reading the symbol at that square, looking at the output of the transition function to decide what to do next. Right? And the transition function returns the next state, the symbol to write, and the direction to move. So that's where we're using the transition function. What's missing from this definition? Yeah, at the back. Good, yeah. So the whole point of defining this, right? what it means to execute is we get some output. We haven't said what the output is, right? We've said how we follow transitions. We said how we initialize the machine. We need to get an output. And getting the output is actually kind of tricky. So one way to get the output, which is actually a very reasonable way, is kind of like the finite state machine. So at the end, if you halt, you were in some state. Based on that state, you either output 0 or 1. That's kind of how the finite state machine output function was defined. But the Turing machine, we've got a whole tape. So maybe we can output a lot more. And certainly, if we're thinking of things like computing numbers, we need to output more than just 0 or 1. So Turing's goal was to see, can we output something that represents a number? So we're going to use the state of the tape to learn the output. And so that's what step four is here. If we finish this loop, 
That means that we get to some transition rule where the output direction is halt. Then we get to step four, and step four says the output is what's on the tape, except for we're going to ignore all the blanks at the end. We want the output to be finite, and the tape's infinite. But at some point, everything to the right of where we are is a blank. And the way it's defined skips the first square, which started as a triangle. That kind of assumes you're not going to overwrite that triangle. It takes everything from the first square up to the last square that's not a blank. And that's our output. Otherwise, the output is undefined. And we use that bottom symbol to mean undefined. So it could be undefined because we never finish this loop. We only have an output if we get to step four. Yeah, question? Ah, so yeah, how do you know? If you think of it like this is an infinitely long tape and it's rolled up in some room, and you've got to decide whether something past where you are might be a blank and you see a million blanks, you don't know that the next one would be a blank. Is there a way to know how far you have to look? Where's the furthest non-blank? Yeah. We said we start with i equals 0. And each step, the most we could increase i is by 1. We could decrease i, or we could increase i. So if the machine runs for 1,000 steps, assume we know the length of the input is less than that. Do we know if there are any non-blanks after index 1,000? It's, it's sort of the max of the number of steps in n, because we do start at 0. It could take us n steps to get to the end of the input. If we run for less than n steps, the input is still there. But once we run for more than n steps, that's all that matters. We haven't ridden in any squares further away from where we started than the number of steps, let's say, say s steps. This definition makes sense, even if you can't look at the whole tape. If we had to do this in practice, we can look at what we need, because we know how many steps we ran for. We can keep track of that. So we know that nothing beyond that can be non-blank. I'll point at the difference in the definition from what's in the book. The book is the smallest integer like this, and mine is the smallest integer where it's a blank. Do those definitions produce different outputs? Both of them. If there's a blank in the middle, m will still be higher than that if there's a non-blank after it. The question is more, this one will stop at the last 0 or 1. If there's, say, some other symbol after those that's not a 0 or 1, this definition would not include it, whereas this one would include it. So this one's going to include everything before the last non-blank. So if we're thinking of this as a function that should output a string in 0, 1 star, if we have more symbols, it's going to output some strings that it shouldn't output. But this one also includes those. It will include, if there's a, a funny symbol before the last blank, it's going to include it. So the definition, I think, is probably the best is to actually just include all the zeros and ones on the tape and ignore everything else. That's different from either of these. But the good news is we don't have to worry too much about that. For a specific Turing machine, if you're implementing one and you care what the output is, you definitely have to worry about which definition of how you get the output from the machine. In terms of the big questions that we're trying to use these to model, it's not going to make a difference. This is how Turing actually defined it, which is partly why I like the, let's just take the zeros and ones on the tape. He had a notion of printing a zero or a one as you operated, which was kind of separate from the tape, what you were printing. You still had the tape that you could use to keep track of things, and then you had the output that you were printing on a blank tape. That is what he viewed as the output a separate tape that you print up, which is not what we usually use today. But this gets at the notion of what computable numbers are, is if you can output on that tape the sequence of zeros and ones that represents the number, then it's a computable number.